The American Society on Aging was founded in 1954. 66 years later, people are living prosperous and longer lives. However, many are living with social and economic inequities and inequalities. And the pandemic, it has reminded us that this country doesn't embrace aging. What will happen in 10 years when one in five Americans will be over 65? The American Society on Aging is transforming itself to tackle the challenges and invest in the opportunities that this demographic change will bring. The new ASA reflects our year-long programming and meaningful membership experience. The new ASA reflects our commitment to unite, to empower, and to champion all of you. But most importantly, the new ASA reflects our optimism for the future of aging. On behalf of everyone at the American Society on Aging, I am proud to introduce you to the new ASA. Learn more and join us at www.asaging.org. Hi, everyone. I'm Ken Dykewald. I'm the host and moderator of the Legacy Interviews. And we're back for yet another interesting experience. And boy, this is one that's very, very special to me and I'm sure will be to you as well. My guest today is Larry Curley, MPA. Larry is a member of the Navajo Nation and is the executive director of the National Indian Council on Aging, which he helped found way back in 1976. Larry received his master's degree in public administration at the University of Arizona, along with a certificate in gerontology. He began his work in the field of aging as a gerontological planner at the Area Agency on Aging in Pima County, Arizona, and then as a lobbyist in Washington, D.C., successfully advocating for the passage of Title VI of the Older Americans Act, which he also drafted. Larry has also directed the Navajo Nation's Head Start program, which is one of the five largest Head Start programs in the entire country has also served as a tribal nursing home administrator, hospital administrator, and as a college instructor at the University of Nevada. He was twice appointed executive director of the Navajo Nation Division of Health, and he was selected as a Next Avenue influencer in aging. He's also an avid Navajo speaker, and I'm gonna see if I can get him to share some of that with us in a few minutes. But first, let me welcome Larry Curley. Brilliant. Hello, Ken. Good to talk with you and meeting you as well. Good to be with you, Larry. So we're before we jump into some serious issues, uh, we're going to have a little bit of fun. I've got a few pictures here um, that your team sent over, and I'm going to ask you to sort of tell me what we're looking at. So let's start with this one. Can you see that okay? Uh, that uh, woman is my mother. And those are the three brothers. I am the one on the far left. And my older brother is in the middle. And my younger brother is the one with the cowboy hat. <laughs> Roughly, that was, how old were you around there, you think? I was about seven, eight, maybe. About, probably about seven. All right. Next picture. Okay, so this looks to me to be a handwritten document. What is this, Larry? That is the original draft of what became Title VI. And that was drafted in 1975. And uh, this is what was the basis for Title VI of the Older Americans Act. That became law in 1978. Fantastic. All right, what do we got here? Who's that long-haired guy on the left? I think uh, I know who we got on the right. That was about the time when the Older Americans Act like Title VI passed. Older Americans Act like was being amended, and I believe that that was about the time 
um, shortly after President Carter signed off on the law in 1978. Fantastic. And you were 28 then, I guess, huh? Wow. 28 at the time, yes. All right. Who are these folks, Larry? The gentleman on the right, um, Dr. I think it's Buchanan with the Indian Health Service. The woman on the right, I believe, is the president of uh, the national or one of the vice presidents of the National Indian Health Board. Mm -hmm. And obviously, I'm the one in the middle. I would, that was on the occasion of my being selected as the Indian Health Services CEO of the year in 2014. Fantastic. Okay, and who are these folks? Oh, those are the grown-up brothers now. <laughs> <laughs> what are your brothers' names? Uh, starting from the left is my youngest brother. His name is Terry. The next one over uh, to him is my oldest brother, Harry. And the next brother after that is Perry. He's a guy with a cowboy hat. All right. And there's my younger brother, Jerry. And obviously on the end, that's me. And that was at the Grand Canyon. That's fantastic. All right. So let's jump into our, uh, our discussion here. And I've got a lot of questions to go through with you, my friend. So we're going to try to clip along. First, I figured out that you and I, we're both born in March of 1950. So I, until I was five, I lived with my mom and dad and brother in the same house as my grandparents, and then went to school in kind of Newark, New Jersey, and, you know, tried to make something of myself. Tell me about your childhood. Were you raised on a reservation? Were you raised in a city? What was the deal with you and your family? Kind of up... What kind of life did you have as a child? Well, both my both of my parents uh, were not educated in the formal sense. Um, but my dad decided at one point in his life that he can't live on the reservation. He can't make a living. So he decided he'd go off reservation and he went to work as, as a railroad laborer. So he was responsible for driving spikes into the ties. And uh, he started out as a uh, member of what they call extra gangs, meaning that they send these gangs off on the railroad where they need help elsewhere. So I was born somewhere along the way. And my mom was telling us that we lived in places like Kansas, California, because we went up and down the railroad tracks living in these box cars. And my dad always felt like, like some of the other men, they would leave their families at home on the reservation. But my dad felt like it's his responsibility. It's his family. He needs to take care of them. And so he took us everywhere on those railroad tracks. But we grew up um, alongside the railroad tracks and every summer, we would get shipped off to the reservation because that's where grandma and grandpa were. And we were supposed to chop wood for them, carry water for them, go after the sheep uh, out there on the reservation. So, so qu question for you. Did your parents speak English? Did they make it through high school? They didn't speak English. Wow. Uh, they never went to school. But somewhere along the way, they both felt like education is, is something that is important. You need to get as much education as you can. And so I remember coming back from school every day because I didn't speak English either when I started school and, but it took a while to learn. And remember those uh, Dick and Jane and Sally and- Yeah, sure. 
Forbesman Publishers, Tom, Dick, and Jane and their dog Spot. Yep, that one. And what was interesting was that when we would read that in, in school, in class, it would say, run, spot, run, 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 run. So when I would go out on the playgrounds and during recess, I had a best friend by the name of Frankie. I would say, run, Frankie, run, <laughs> run, run. And I couldn't understand why all those other kids were laughing at me. All right, so take me into your world a little bit, and I'm going to ask you some questions, and there's a reasonable chance uh, my ignorance is going to show, and I apologize for that. Do you prefer being thought of as a Native American, as an Indian, or as an indigenous person? What do you think about those different names? Well, I grew up in the time where we were called American Indians, and so I... Basically, that's what I say. I'm 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 American Indian. Uh, sometimes I say I'm a native, uh, but the word indigenous is a new uh, word out there in Indian country. So a lot of younger people are using that as uh, a way of identifying themselves. But I I use American. And I'm an American Indian. Okay, help me out here because I don't know that I would know the sound of Navajo. Can and I know you're a Navajo speaker, and you're one of the elders. So can you share with me some thoughts in Navajo? What did you just say? I said, we are now talking about how we can improve the lives of older people. And this is what this conversation is all about. Well, I'm going to try something here. So my researcher has taught me that you are, I'm going to say this, I apologize, but you're one of the Oze Ashei Hopi Salt People clan, born for Tan Anzani the Tangled People Clan. Now, I, I must have messed that up. What does that mean, the Tangled People Clan, the Salt People Clan? Tell us about that. Well, in, in, our, in our community and in our culture, your clan, your, who you are, comes from the, the matriarchal side. So I am, my mother was a Hopi Salt Clan, Jose Ashina. So that is now who I am. And I was born for a particular clan. That was my father's clan. And that one is Katniss Zafni. That's a Chango Wee clan. But to make it complete, I also have to say on my maternal side who my grandparents were. And on that side, is Kachitni, red streak on the forehead. And on my paternal side, it's Ashini, salt clan. Mm. So those are the four clans. And by those four clans, I have relatives everywhere. How many Indian tribes are there in America? Last count, 575 tribes. And how many different dialects or languages are there, Indian? There are approximately 250 different languages that are still spoken out there. How many Indians, American Indians, are there? Is it 100,000? Is it a million? Roughly. Approximately 5 million that are out there now and growing. And how many of those would be pure blood versus marriages that split people into different versions and connections? Well, what I found some time back was that among Caucasians, white people marry white people 95% of the time. Among 
African Americans, African Americans marry other African Americans 85% of the time. Among the American Indian population, 51% marry outside the race. Fascinating. So it's really an interracial kind of uh, thing that's happening. Well, I'm going to ask you a silly question here, and then we're going to get into a little deeper water. But so I'm very envious of your beautiful hair. And it looked to me in a few of the pictures, you used to have long hair. Have you cut your hair short? Um, I had it short until COVID started. Well, wait, wait. Have you got a ponytail back there? Yes, you do. Very beautiful. <laughs> You're terrific. Hey, a sensitive question. Um, the white population of America has certain expectations of longevity. How long did your mom and dad live? My mother passed away when she was 50. And my father passed away when he was 63. And so they died relatively young. So there's a lot of different words being used to describe people of our age, senior, older adult, elder. How do you think of yourself in terms of these words? Which do you prefer? I, uh, I look at myself in, um, as a person that has experience who has seen the world through a number of different experiences and that has created a certain knowledge base. And I would imagine younger people look at me as an elder and they come to me sometimes, they say, what do you think about this? Or what are your thoughts about that? What would you do about that? So from their perspective, they see me as an elder. Um, from my side, I'm just, I'm just an individual who happened to have 70 some years behind, under their belt. You know, I don't, I don't, con I don't consider myself in, uh, in, in any particular category. All I know is I still have a lot of energy. I still have a lot of innovative, creative, and still have that desire to change the world. Fabulous. So Larry, uh, as a very young man, I mean, you know, there are people on this call from all over the world, some professionals in the field a long time, some students. You've been going at this for over 45 years now. I mean, you were writing legislation when you were a young man in your 20s. Um, what got you motivated to work in the field of aging? and to be involved in aging services as a 24-year-old, 25-year-old guy? I, uh, I think that part of it has always been what my dad and my parents taught us, and that is when you get an education, you use that education to help people. That is not personal property, it is community property. Your education is community property. You use it to help people. And of all the people that I thought about when I was going through grad school was, what can I major in? And it just so happened that I ran across a gentleman, one of my professors by the name of Ted Koff. I knew Ted. He said mm -hmm. to me, you know, Larry, you got to get into this field. And uh, so he convinced me and I got into the field and I ended up after my uh, schoolwork, I had to do an internship. And I ended up interning with another, with an area agency on aging in Tucson and mentored by a woman by the name of Marion Lupu. Those two are the bedrock of why I got actually totally involved and committed to the field. So I knew Marion Lupu well, and she was wise and tough. How did she take to you? The first day I walked in, she uh, asked if I could have an internship. She looked at me. I walked into her office. She had this big bun on top of her head, 
had a pair of glasses sitting in their hair, had one sitting on the tip of her nose, another one hanging around her neck, and she was talking on two phones at the same time and writing. When she finished, she looked at me and she says, and what do you want? And I said, I'd like to do an internship. She slammed her hand out on the table and she says, I don't like interns. They waste my time. <laughs> but eventually she did say, all right, I'll bring you on for six months. And she hired me. She, I stayed on. And I must say that she taught me a lot, taught me everything about the field of aging, commitments that are required, the passion that you need to have. Um, and, and, and she was a, a, an exceptional woman. Larry, I'm going to ask you a sensitive question, but you seem open to open to these topics. So uh, as an American Indian, I imagine you have faced certain prejudices or discrimination or ignorances. You know, now there's a lot of talk about diversity and inclusion and equity and such, but you know, 50 years you've been a professional almost in this field. What's, how would you describe to us what it's been like to be an honorable member of the Navajo tribe and a spokesperson for your people? I, I think that that's something that I've always felt we have a responsibility, that we need to present the best side of Indian country, the best values that we have and share with it. Uh, with the rest of the world, the rest of the people, whether they be Indian or not. And I think that's been my purpose, I believe, is that I know everything about the non-Indian world. <clears throat> I know what Christianity is like. I know what the tenets of it are. I know what patriotism is. I know all of those values. I want a three bedroom home with a white picket fence with a color TV and a Volvo in the front yard. I know those values. I know, I, I learned the language. I learned everything about the non-Indian world. But there's very little coming back from the other side that they don't really know that much about me, don't know that much about Indian country. And it's, my obligation and responsibility to also educate the rest of the world on who we are, about what we believe in, what our value systems are, so that it can be a respectful society and the world that we live in. Give me an example of a couple of things that you feel that everyone should know and respect and understand about, as you call it, Indian country. We have right now, for example, in the non-Indian world, we have, uh, let's say the Mormon Tabernacle in Salt Lake City. We have St. Patrick's Cathedral. Those are sacred places. We, this is our country. I hear this thing about take our country back. I don't know what they're talking about. It is our country. When I walk here on this planet around this place in Albuquerque, New Mexico, I see immediately to the west of me, a mountain It's called Mount Taylor. That's one of our four sacred mountains. That's our tabernacle. That's our St. Patrick's Cathedral. And I tell people, those are us. They're sacred to us. Bears Ears, for example, up in Northwest New Mexico, that is sacred to us. It's sacred land. In fact, all of this country is sacred land because 
that building that was built in New York City was built on the dust and the ashes of the ancestors of those people that used to live there. That is sacred ground. This entire country to me is sacred because that's where our ancestors are. They were buried there. How do you manage to not be angry and contemptuous of the, the kinds of ignorance that is shown towards American Indians? You seem to be in a positive guy. How do you not get angry? I guess one thing that I do know is that, um, maybe it's because I'm an elder now, I don't know, is that you can't control how other people act, but you can control how you react to how they treat you. And so that is, but back in my younger days, the late sixties, when I was younger and I was going through college, you know, that's about the time when we have the, uh, the Black Panthers, we had the Brown Berets, we had the Red Power Movement, which later evolved into American Indian Movement. But I grew up in a small town that was a very, very utopian in some sense, in that it was a very accepting community. It was a small town in Northern Arizona. So when I moved from that particular community and from that school and went down to a college, and all of a sudden you have African Americans, Hispanics, white people, uh, white people broken down into what they used to call dopers who was with the then we had the the ropers which are the you know the rancher types and then there were the rich kids rich white kids that's when i realized there was a difference mm. there was a difference out there and the more i started looking into indian country and looking at indian history i began to see all of the things that happened to indian people from the time that the Spaniards came here. And I became very angry. I was very anti-angry. I'm very anti-rest of society, and specifically white people, because they were the perpetrators of a lot of the atrocities that occurred. And I stayed that way for quite some time. I would say probably angry for about four or five years. And then one day, something happened to my heart. And I found this young lady that I fell in love with. And an abomination. It was a white girl. Mm -hmm. We married. We had two children. And that's when I realized, you know what? There is no color to love. Hmm. And so from that point on, I don't carry all that animosity and that bitterness and that anger that I had because I know it will pass and I'm one of that 51 percent I was talking about <laughs> marrying outside the race outside the race I'm one of them and you gotta see my my three kids mm. beautiful people good people do your kids speak any Navajo unfortunately no unfortunately no all right, we're going to return to that in a moment. We're now going to turn a little bit. And first of all, thank you so much for your, your wisdom and your heartbeat. Um, let's look at the subject of aging and the field of aging in which you have devoted your career. Let me start with sort of a simple question. In an ideal world, what role would elders play? I really think that elders have a tremendous amount of experience. They've gone through the ups and downs of life. And I think that in that 
and that experience and the knowledge that they've gained should be something that is valued and that people that we call leaders should be willing to talk with them and get their advice and get their knowledge and young people should be going to them as well so that they don't repeat the same mistakes um a council of elders for example wouldn't that be great in the white house mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah so how how do the american indian communities view the role of older people or elders different than maybe the non-Indian communities. Is there a special regard for elders within Indian nation? I think that compared to, let's say, when I first started out in the field of aging, there was still a tremendous, a lot of respect and a lot of uh, a position that elders held in their communities, a highest thing. I think that 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 particular kind of respect and esteem has dropped a little bit, but I think that as a result of the pandemic, all of a sudden they're beginning to realize elders are important. I think tribal leaders are putting them back on the pedestal that elders should be. Um, I have a question. I have a quote from you, Larry. In one of your interviews, you said the elderly Indian population are our last link to our language, to our traditions, to the spirituality that's very important. So say some more about that, how the younger people are not speaking the native tongues, how the younger people may not feel the connection to the land, the younger people may not. And so those elders, as the passage as the passers of all that are even more important than we ever might have imagined. Um, what would you do to try to create more bridges between the elder and young within the American Indian nation? Well, I think that there ought to be more um, intergenerational programs and emphasis on intergenerational programs. Um, for example, um, the Head Start program that I used to run. It would have been fantastic to utilize elderly people to teach the Navajo language, the language, uh, Navajo traditions in the Head Start program so that at the same time, they can be learning about the larger society just as I did. I grew up knowing Navajo, the culture, all of that stuff. And then I went to school and then I learned everything about the rest of the world. I think that that's how we can utilize our elders and make it make our language um, stronger, our customs stronger, reaffirm who we are. Um, that I think is is something that really needs to be looked at. Um, unfortunately, this is kind of interesting that you asked me that, uh, Kim because back in the late 70s, when I was advocating for the Older America's Act like Title VI program in, in Washington, D.C., while I was there, I started talking about intergenerational programs. Back and then. Was, back so then. Now we hear lots of talk about Encore and Gen to Gen and Generations United and later, you know, a few decades before was Maggie Kuhn, Youth and Age in Action. But you were thinking this way almost 50 years ago. Back in 1977, 78, I was pushing for that, to be included in the Title VI program. Because back then, we were still, I thought that was something important. But a lot of the other national aging organizations felt like, we can't support this, Larry, because we have fought for too long to have our own aging programs and we don't want it to be watered down. And so Title VI passed with what has happened is that the elderly people were segregated on reservations. They had their own senior centers 
and right across the street was the Head Start program. And you had two buses, one bus going over to the Head Start program, a van going over to the elderly program. Wouldn't it have been great to have the, both the young and the old in that same bus as they're zipping off to these two facilities? Yes, sir. How would I say yes, sir, in Navajo? Oh. Say it again? Oh. Oh, that's oh. easy. That's yeah. one I can get. <laughs> All right, so ageism is a subject that there's more and more discussion about disrespect and dislike of older people. There's this phrase, okay, boomers. A lot of young people think older people have somehow created the problems and maybe we have in the world. What's the deal with this ageism? Why do you think there's so much disregard and disrespect? Now, I'm asking you to put your hat on as a gerontologist here. What's up with that? I think we have been a society that has really uh, put, the, put youth as some kind of a value. We look at aging and getting old as something that's to be um, to be ignored or, or put under the, the rug, put it away, out of sight. Let's concentrate on our youth, maintain our youth. We have Botox, we have plastic surgery, we have hair color dyeing unit. We have this whole society that is so stuck, some kind of a uh, obsession with youth. I mean, we've gone through it. You and I have gone through it. Everybody has gone through it. We are now where we are. And I think that this is a society that really has still looks at youth and that this, that there's this belief that when you get to be a certain age, you're not as smart as you used to be. You're not as valuable as you used to be. You're not a contributing member of society as much as you were before. You're much slower, you know, you, 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 you don't have the energy that the young people have. There's that, that whole belief system that I feel that this current generation of older people, because I don't feel old, you know, I, I still am able to jump out of bed and I can still jump over a fence <laughs> and I can still climb a ladder to the roof to fix the, uh, the, the uh, evaporative cooler. You know, I can still do that. I don't feel that. And so I think that people see the physical parts of me. Um, they see the wrinkles on my face and they see the gray hair. And all I can say to them is I earn every white strand of hair and every wrinkle <laughs> on my face. <laughs> all right. So let me ask you a question that I've been asking you of the of our other legacy interview subjects. So people like you were seeing ageism 40, 50 years ago. You wanted Head Start to be a part of the Older Americans Act. People like you have been hospital administrators, long-term care administrators. You've been a spokesperson. You've been bringing things together. You've seen a world where the generations can be more involved. And you've also envisioned a healthier version of aging. But how come we still have so much sickness? How come we still have so much disrespect? How come we still have so much ageism? Have we failed? Have those of us who have been at this for 40 years or so, have we failed? Because these problems still exist. I sometimes look back um, like um, our age, can, like I said, I grew up during the, uh, the San Francisco flower power movement. Love can solve. We had really, I, a lot of the students, a lot of the people that I grew up with and my classmates, very idealistic. They looked at the world positively. They believed 
in a in almost a utopian world. The people that I knew, we protested, we marched, we did all of that. Here we are 50 years later. And yeah, I feel like we missed something along the way. A lot of those people that I grew up with who had the very liberal values, who had that belief that things can change, are now, some of them are on the far right of the political spectrum. A lot of them have become less liberal. And, and I see that as a failing. Why, why didn't they keep that yeah. Yep. in them? I hear you. So let me ask you a personal question. You are a trailblazer yourself. You're a, I'm going to use the word warrior. Um, when you get knocked down or when you get disappointed, because there's a lot of younger people watching now wondering, you know, how does, what makes a person be able to get back up again? What motivates you, Larry? What, what motivates you to keep driving forward and trying to do good for others? Well, again, it goes back to my, my, my younger days when my father used to kick us out of bed at five o'clock in the morning and made us run five miles down the railroad tracks, five miles out early in the morning, winter, summer, five miles out, five miles back. And I remember him saying one day, you probably think I'm really mean, huh? Well, he said, when you're running out there in that cold, mentally, you're braving the cold. Physically, you're building your body up. Spiritually, you're seeing the morning sun, the sunrise, the dawn coming at you. That's when all the good blessings come. It's, the world is tough out there. And what I'm doing is training you to get ready for that world that you're going to be entering. And so every time something happens where I get knocked down, I go back to that teaching. You get back up. Wow. Get back wow. up. When you look at your career for this last half century, what do you think are your greatest accomplishments? Or what is it you feel like I'm so glad I brought that about. And where were your shortcomings? Well, I think that the uh, the passage of the the old the Title VI of the Older Americans Act is probably something that I I really looking back on it now, forty some years later. I think that that was something that I really feel proud of that it's I think it's also a, a monument to to the mentality of one person can make a change one person can make a change and I feel good about that now that I look back on it I see all of those senior centers and all those meal sites on Indian reservations that have come out of that yellow piece of paper that handwritten that's what that piece of paper represents to me. And are there ways in which you, as you look at your career and your life, you think, oh, I should have fought harder, or why didn't I get that done? Or do you have, do you do that in your own mind? Do you question your effectiveness? Once in a while, yeah, I think that I could have fought harder for the intergenerational programming way back when but i think that the end result of that the impact has been by my not having fought hard enough that we segregated our old people from the younger population and that the ramifications today are our younger people are learning less of their language less of their traditions less of their culture 
as a result of the segregation that we built. And it's also, I think, ironic that about 15 years after Title VI was passed, the national aging organizations now started talking about intergenerational programming. But yep. you know, I look back and I go, why didn't you say that 15 years ago? Yep, I hear you. And a couple of more questions, and then we're going to turn the corner to our last section where I'm going to ask you some personal questions about aging. So what advice, Larry, would you give to the next generation of change makers? What counsel would you give them? What advice? I would say find something that you believe in. And I am hoping that they can take a look at what has been done in the field of aging and say, I can make a difference. I can make a difference. And they, that commitment, that passion, that fire in the belly, that can keep them going for years and years and years. You know, I've had people who I, tribal members that I went to school with who had that fire in the belly. And a few years later, I ran across them when I was working for the Navajo Nation and they had just totally gone stale. Mm. And I said, what happened to you? What happened to that fire that you had? And the person said to me, Larry, they beat it out of me. They beat it out of me. The system beat it out of them. Do, do you feel the aging field itself, all the conferences and the professionals in the field are change makers or do you think they're just holding steady? I think the people that are that I have worked with in the past and even currently in the field of aging are still looking for change or they wouldn't be in the field. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be here if I didn't think that I could make a difference somewhere. And what I would like to see is that I have the opportunity to bring more young people, young native people back into the field of aging so that we have another cadre of people that can continue to fight uh, after I'm long gone. Fabulous. I, um, by the way, if there's any role I can personally play, even though I'm kind of a white guy, uh, I would love to be a part of something like that, just so you know. Um, why should somebody consider working in the aging field versus in tech or versus, versus childhood education? Or what about the subject or the phenomenon of aging? Why should people work in that field? I think that one of the things that I think about um, is that my daughter, and I'll use that as an as analogy, my daughter is an artist. She paints, she's a great painter, she's a great artist. And one day she said, you know, dad, I can teach you how to mix paints. I can tell you what the qualities or the, 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 qual uh, the, the characteristics of oil versus acrylic are. I can show you all of that. I can use, show you how to use the brush. But unless it's in here, in your, in you, you will never create a Mona Lisa. And I think that people who are drawn to the field of aging have that inside them. There are other people who are made to be computer techs. There are other people who are born to be looking at the little print in the, in the law books, you know. That's them. But there's that group of people that have something inside of them that says, I want to help. I want to change the world. And those are the people that I think would be drawn into the field of aging and make a tremendous impact. Thank you. We're going to turn out to our last section of questions, and it has to do with uh, when aging turns personal. So 
someone like yourself was writing about and making policy and creating programs pertaining to aging, you were 25, you were 30, you're 35. Now you're a 71 year old guy. Um, it might seem like an odd question, but for you, has your aging been an ascent or has it been a descent? It's been an ascent. Explain. Because I think one of the things that has really helped, you know, one time I sat down, I thought about all of the elderly people that I knew and have known from the time I went to work for the FEMA Council on Aging. I knew every one of them. I knew how old they were then. And all the people that I've met since then who are elderly, like, for example, Maggie Kuhn and those people. I think of them. I added up all of their years one time. <laughs> I counted 2,000 years of experience and wisdom that I gained from the people that I knew. And that is what I look at. And I say, I now have this 2,000 years of knowledge and wisdom oh, yeah. in my head that I need to share with other people, that I need to share with our younger people. That's a fabulous way of thinking about it. I love that. Fabulous way of thinking about it. So I was reading, and I'm not going to try to say it, but there was a Navajo prayer for these difficult times that begins with, with beauty before me, I walk. But do you know that prayer? And could you say it to us in Navajo? I can. Thank you. You're welcome. A couple more questions. I'm going to hit you with a few quick ones here. Um, is there any particular philosophy or person that's been your biggest source of inspiration in your work, in your life, and in this field? Is there, is there a religion or a book you read or a speech or a, a mentor? What's been your biggest source of inspiration, Larry? Frederick Nietzsche. Really? Yeah. <laughs> wow. Uh, really? Well, now I got to ask you to say some more about that. I was not <laughs> expecting that. Because one of the things that he said was that to be human is to be human is to create. But that we also have another part of it. And that is to be really human, is to destroy the things that you create. Because otherwise, if you don't destroy it, you end up worshiping what you created. And it becomes the golden calf. In my life, in my time, I have seen things that people have created. And I have to come along and destroy it because there's a new world out there. And you have to adapt that whatever it is to the new world. And once you've created it, you've got to destroy it again and build another model. And so, you know, to me, like, it's like what we do in the field of aging. There's a specific program or project that was created, let's say in Cincinnati, Ohio. We take that model and we come out to Indian country and we slap a feather on it. <laughs> I would say it's an Indian program, but all you're doing is is superimposing other people's experience in Indian country and turning them less Indian. We ought to be able to destroy that model in Cincinnati and create it in our own communities that fit us. Thank you. Uh, what are you most afraid of? What scares you in your life? I really think that, I think about the future a lot. I think about who we are. 
I use a metaphor um, that I talk about sometimes, and that is, you know, it would be really, really cool. It would be really great if they could take me right now, freeze me, put me into a time capsule, and 2,000 years from now, open up that time capsule, unfreeze me, and the door opens up, Tim, and there is this young lady standing there, white, red hair, blue eyes. And she says to me, I don't care what that person looks like, but that person is a Navajo. And that person says to me, the Navajo people have survived another 2,000 years. I get afraid sometimes when I see, for example, when I live back in the, on the East Coast, names of tribes that used to exist no longer there. I, that's what scares me the most. I want to see my people, Indian people, survive the next 2,000 years. Well, um, let me ask you another question. I've only got a couple, three to go. If you could go back in time and sit with your young self, your 20-year-old self, and provide some elder wisdom and some elder guidance, what would you tell your young self? Well, Larry, <laughs> you're, you have a long ways to go. You were born on the railroad tracks. You were lived by the railroad tracks. Your livelihood, your father was working on the railroad tracks. Larry, walk out to those rails. Those rails start parallel. And if you watch into the distance, it will go off somewhere. Follow that trail. Follow that those rail tracks. It will lead you to a different world, different experiences, and from those you'll be able to take what you learn to help your people. Stay on the track, on the rails. That's what I would say to them. Two more questions. Um, there's a lot of fear among some older people about the idea of dying you having been raised with your traditions and being a part of the Indian nation, what is your view about the arc of life or the end of life? Well, I think that the creator, God, whoever that we want to call, said, you know, this particular individual Larry Curley, let's allot him a certain amount of time. That's his to do with as he wants. Hopefully he'll do something good with it. So I know that I have a lot of time. I don't know how long that is, but in that time I have, I'm going to give everything that I've got to change the world, make things better for people. And when that day comes, well, it came, and I will realize that I, hopefully, I will remember what one of my elders back from Tucson said to me that one day. She said to me, Larry, honey, there is one wish I have for you that is in that last 30 seconds of your life as you're gasping for your last breath of air that you say, I have no regrets. I have done what I wanted to do. So my last question for you, my friend, 
it's decades from now, many decades from now, I'm gone, you're gone, all these legacy interview folks are gone. What would you like for people to remember about Larry Curley? Or what would you like them to say about Larry Curley? He was? He tried. And he gave it his best. And he's an okay guy. <laughs> That's what I want them to say about me. Well, I'm going to say that um, spending this hour with you is an honor for me. Your honesty, your life, your stories, what you've been through, what you have fought for, what way you've impacted millions of people's lives and intend to keep doing that. You're an extraordinary human. And uh, I'm going to end by saying to you in Navajo, hey, Guni. Be well. You too. Thank you.